in the world. Oh, we're, we're dialing in. Oh, you're live. <laughs> Welcome all the alumni and friends who are joining us for this shiur from Mayanot here in Yerushalayim with all the students over here. And today's shiur is Le'ili Nishmas, my nephew, Moshe Deitch, whose yorzeit, his first yorzeit is coming up this Thursday, Gimel Odor. Hashem took him back early as a young man, and uh, he was a very, very edela and beautiful neshama, beloved by all his friends. Um, when you learn Pirkei Oves, when you learn Pirkei Oves, there's 48 drochim, 48 ways that the Torah is nicknessed, that we, we acquire Torah. And one is Ohuv, to be beloved. And Moshe was beloved by all his friends and all his family. Oyeva Sabrius, he loves people. When you love people, you are beloved. So tonight, the shir is Le'ili Nishmasei, because when you learn Torah, it is a zechus for the neshama. So Be'ezus Hashem, the Torah that we're going to learn, the shir that Rabbi Kaufman is giving, and the chassidus we're learning, should be Le'ili Nishmas, Moshe ben Menachem Mendel, and Basia. I just also want to mention, the Rebbe always emphasized at a yard site, at a special time, we should think about the person, but also learn from the person. When the Rebbe passed away, every single week when the Rebbe forbranged, he spoke about what can we take to heart? And on the Shleshim of Meshi, many of his friends spoke. And they all spoke personal stories about times when they were down and the person they felt they could go and speak to, who would listen and feel for them and empathize, was Moshi. And this quality in Pirkei Ovis is known as Noise Ba'olim Chaveroi, to be able to carry the burden with your friend. Be able to listen to a friend, and it takes a certain quality of openness to be non-judgmental. People are sensitive to the fact when they're speaking to you if you really care. So if you really care, then people will come to you to speak to you and ask for a favor and ask for help. And that's called noisib olam chaveri, to carry the burden. If you think of the imagery, all means a yoke. So you can think of a yoke, you know, carrying, uh, you know, carrying a burden. When another person joins in and takes part of that burden, suddenly the burden is much lighter. And sometimes the burden even disappears. So a lesson you should learn from Moshe, Moshe ben Menachem Mendel and Basia, is this quality of which in today's modern world, is incredibly important. Sometimes we're so busy getting ahead in life and so busy in the world of social media posting what we're doing, we don't always see what others need. So tonight we can think about what do others need? What does my friend need? What is perhaps a bit of a yoke? What is a bit of a burden? So there's a Hashem, we should have an alias and a shama, should be a male yosher for the mishpacha, the entire mishpacha, and uh, we should be zeicher soon to be mashiach for Mashiach, the kids to run in the offer. Like introduced Rabbi Kaufman, you all know. Thank you, Rabbi Gestatner. So I was asked to give this year. Um, I was asked for the title, and I said it's the Sicha in the volume 19 of the Kutte Sichas and Parshish Nitzavim on free will. And I said, well, what's the title? And I said, I'm teaching part of the Sicha in volume 19, the Parshish Nitzavim on free will. You can call it whatever you want. <laughs> um, the reason why I wanted to actually learn in the text, um, especially since we're live streaming, is that I feel that an important thing um, in learning, especially in learning chassidus, is that very often um, 
we can get carried away with our ability to think things through and to explain things and to ask questions. And we often forget that the Rebbe, with great and serious nefesh, gave us 39 volumes of Kutai Sichas, several volumes of Sefer Sichas, and numerous Sichas that weren't edited, where the Rebbe addressed many, many issues clearly, explicitly. And obviously, they're poor in one place and rich in another. There's no one place where it's all covered. And a person has to learn more and more. But to actually see at least how one issue is addressed in the text, I think gives a certain rigor and a certain integrity to our understanding of important issues. Now, this sicha, um, those of you who have the handouts here, they were photocopied so nicely, um, but out of order. <laughs> so the last page is the first page. So it's very simple. Just put the last page as a Rashi. Now, as much as I would like to learn the entire sicha inside, um, I don't think that time permits that. So we're only going to be learning one ois, one section of the sicha in the actual text. Um, and moreover, as much as I'd like to learn the sicha in the original Yiddish, the Rebbe edited the sicha, um, I was advised by people who are wiser than myself that more people would be able to follow if we learned it in the Hebrew version. So that's what we're going to be doing. Yeah. So before we get started, I want to learn through the Rashi. It's a Rashi sicha. Um, and briefly summarize where the Sicha is holding, where the Rebbe is holding his explanation of the issues before we actually get into Eish um, Aleph, uh, chapter 11 of the Sicha, which is the part that we're going to be focusing on. So there's Rashi, it's cut off a bit at the top, and I apologize, but the Rashi is commenting on the Pasuk, Uvacharta Vachayim, you should choose life. The Pasuk tells us, Meish Rebbeinu tells us, See, I place before you a the life and good. Rashi says that the good is the listening to Hashem, which brings life. And the evil, which is on the opposite of listening to Hashem, which brings the opposite of life. And the Pasuk goes on to elaborate on what it means to listen to Hashem. And then it concludes, after several Pasuk later, you should choose life. And on this this uh, instruction, Rashi has what appears to be an unnecessarily long comment, uh, which we're going to learn inside, and focus again on where the how the Rebbe uh, presents the Rashi up to the point of where we're going to get the Sikh inside. So Rashi explaining this instruction, this 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 um, phrase in the pasuk, the heart of Chaim choose life which means listen to the Ebershter such that you perceive life. He says like this, I instruct you, you should choose the portion of life. And then Rashi gives us a muscle, an analogy. Like someone who tells his son, select for yourself an excellent portion of my estate that the son <laughs> should choose which part of his father's estate he should inherit. His father has many lands, he has good quality lands, low quality lands, and the father instructs the son, choose a good portion. And then, moreover, the father, the father actually takes his son to the good portion, the Eimerlein says to the son, this part, this is what you should choose for yourself. Because he's not just giving him a, a, a general instruction, go find a good part, the father actually takes him, physically stands him by the part, and says, this is the good part, this is what you should choose. <clears throat> now you'll notice I put an arrow, both in the English and the Hebrew, to divide the Rashi into two, um, because as we see the Rebbe explains that the Rashi, there's really two distinct ideas here. The Rashi continues, regarding this it says, Hashem is my appointed share, my drinking cup. You have upheld my lot. Meaning, what? You place my hand on this good lot. Laimar, as if to say, take this for yourself. And this second half, seemingly all Rashi is doing is bringing psukim from later on in Tanakh, from Tehillim, which confirm the same idea that Hashem himself actually brings the yid to the good portion and says, choose this part that I've actually placed you on. Okay. Now, as many Rashi Sikhas 
this sicha has two halves. There's a half where the Rebbe analyzes the Rashi, given the general rule that Rashi is always explaining the simple meaning of the Pasuk, and Rashi does not say anything unnecessary to add beyond the straightforward meaning of the Pasuk. It's a wonderful explanation. I encourage everyone to learn it. It's the sicha in Parshas and Tzavim, the third sicha, Chilak Yutas, volume 19. The second half of the sicha, as is usual with Rashi Sikha, the Rebbe moves on to the Yeina Shaltari, the Chassidus that is alluded to in Rashi. And the Rebbe points out that Rashi in his wording is making reference to two distinct ideas, two different concepts of free will, of choice, of choosing that are explained in Chassidus. So first, the verb that's used for choosing, there's obviously the word bachar, which is a choice, but there's also the word brer, which this translation translates as choose, but brer is like the same idea as uh, bayer on Shabbos, right? The idea of selecting. The idea of bayer is when you have different things mixed together and you have to select out what is the good thing, what is the bad thing. What do I want? What do I not want? Okay, It's a decision-making process. So in that first section, the father says, he says to him, this you should select for yourself. Meaning, so what should you do? Granted, I put you on this on this lot, and I told you it's a good one, but what you should do is you should actually look at this piece of land, compare it to the other pieces of the land, and you should come to the decision that this is the best decision, that this is the right idea. You should weigh the pros and the cons the, the, the benefits, the disadvantages, and come to the conclusion that this is, in fact, the ideal, the best part of my estate. That's what Bayer means. Bayer, to select, means to actually appreciate what makes the two things different, okay? And obviously, not just to do that academically, but to follow through. This connects the idea that he, that this 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 part of the estate is called a chalik, a portion. And in Chassidus, the word chalik is always used in association with what's called a veda pitam vedas, which means using your mind, using your experiences, using your individual uh, character traits to incorporate an. Hashem into your life. Okay. Tam Vedas, as there's many people who understand Tam Vedas, it simply means you have a good rational argument. Tam Vedas means that it comes through a personal appreciation and it's and it's part of who you are. It's integrated into your own unique way of understanding the world, your own unique life experiences. In other words, Tam Vedas differentiates one person from another. What is it that makes my connection to Hashem unique? That my way of appreciating Hashem, my way of appreciating Torah, mitzvahs, the role they play, and chas v'sham, the negativity of the opposite, that is unique based on how my mind works, how my experiences have shaped me. That's tam v'das. And whenever the word chelik is used, it's talking about how each person is distinct. Each person is unique. They have their chelik. Every Jew has their chelik in Ayom Habo. So in order to have your unique portion, it has to be filtered through your own mind, your own experiences. And the big advantage of that is that it's integrated into you. It's part of you. Okay. Now, later on in the second half of the Rashi, this, the, it, it, the, 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 this, this thing is called not just the chilek, but also geirali, my lot, from the word geiril, like a lottery, which connects, obviously, we're coming to Rishchadish Adar and Purim, Purim Hashem Apur is a lottery. And a lottery in Chassidus is understood to refer to the exact opposite of a chilek. A lottery is the idea that there is no real justification. When you try and explain, and if you throw a lottery, so why did I win and you didn't win? That's right, that's what happened. It can't be explained. Now, obviously, this idea of a lottery connotes this idea that something is completely arbitrary. 
Um, and, and the Rebbe explains in a very famous Mimer, uh, Al Kain Karu, Yud Gimel, 1953, about how there's no arbitrariness. Um, but the idea of the girl is not so much that it's arbitrary, that it's capricious, that there's no justification, but that there's no external justification. Meaning like this. If I've come to some decision of why Terry mitzvahs are meaningful to me, why a relationship with the Abishta matters to me based on my own mind and how it works and my experiences, even though it's unique to me, I can present it in a way that's intelligible, that resonates with other people. Right? I mean, there's a whole thing of people speaking about their particular life journey and how they discovered Yiddishkeit or how they well dealt with certain things. And they're sharing their, how they personally dealt with it. And it's very appealing and people want to hear and people are inspired and people resonate. So what does that mean? That means it, it's sensible, it's intelligible, it's relevant from an outside perspective. You don't need to be me to appreciate what's going on with my time for das. Does that mean exactly what will, speaks to me will exactly speak to you? No. But you can at least gain something, you can at least appreciate it. There's this other idea, what's called the gaira, which from the outside, from the perspective of someone outside, and even something from the person himself, it seems complete to be inexplicable, unjustified. Now, to the person himself, it never feels, un, it, it never feels arbitrary, it never feels like they're just being flippant. But it's as if they can't even explain to themselves why it matters so much. This is called above reason. Very simple thing. When uh, a, a, a parent has a child who, who falls or, 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 or something else happens and, and, and there's a concern that perhaps there's a serious thing and they're rushing the child to the hospital, the, 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 the sense of urgency, the sense of immediacy is not, it's almost if something comes over them. Now, parents and the relationship with the children is a common enough thing. We all understand that. But the idea that someone have that kind of intensity, that kind of urgency, that kind of absolutism about the importance of Hashem in their life is something that's, that doesn't make sense to the outside observer. And very often when a person experiences it for themselves, it doesn't make sense to them. A person's overcome, you know, the, this is cliche, a person goes to the Kaisel, they're inspired, they don't know why they're inspired. It bothers them that it means so much to them. Okay? Very often this gairo aspect of the neshama often violates the story we tell about ourselves. That we have a certain explanation of why we do what we do, what matters to us, what our values are, and all of a sudden, this girl seems to reveal that there's something else, something inexplicable about me that moves me towards Hashem and away from Averis. And it, it, it's, hard to, it's hard to put it into words, and it's certainly from an outsider looking at me, it's very hard to see what I'm doing is having any sort of justification. This is the idea of Mesir Snapesh. This is the idea of Tshuva. All of these things are different ways of expressing this idea. Now, what the Rebbe says is that these two ways of choosing life are actually very different. Right? In the first half of the Rashi, in the analogy, the, the Rashi speaks about Chelek a portion, Brerlech select, meaning that a Jew is supposed to choose life. How? By weighing based on their own experiences, based on their own intellect, what are the advantages of Kedusha? What are the advantages of Avedis Hashem? How is that good? And what are the costs? What are the downsides? What are the negatives? And then Klipa, <clears throat> Ra, Chas Hashem, disobeying Hashem. Why is that good? What benefits does it confer? Why is that appealing? And what is, what's negative about it? Like the Mishnah says, that you should weigh the benefits of the mitzvah against the downsides, the benefits of the very against its downside, and you should make the decision that you can say wholeheartedly after taking everything into account based on my own experiences, based on consulting with people I trust, based on personal reflection, I have come to the conclusion that Kedusha, Chaim, Toiv, this is better. That's one way of selecting, or that's one way of choosing, where you're selecting, you're going through a decision process. Okay. And that's true about general things about should I live a, live a life of Torah and mitzvahs versus kash from the opposite, to more particular things such as should I serve Hashem in this manner 
Or serve Hashem in that manner, which is really a question, should I serve Hashem in a way that's honest, or should I delude myself that I'm serving Hashem when I'm really not? There's a, there's, there's, the, the, the Rebbe tells a story. A person came and decided that he has to serve Hashem. And serving Hashem means dear betachtainim. So dear betachtainim, if, if he's going to say Tanya by heart, sitting in yeshiva, sitting in Lubavitch, that's not going to actually bring Hashem to the lowest places. He has to go to the to, to, to the big city and walk outside the theater and there to Chazar Tanya. But then, what is, that's not really Tachtoin, that's not the lowest of places. So he goes into the theater and from into the theater he has to sit in the front row and watch the show and then Chazar Tanya. And everyone understands that such a person, right, is not, they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing, right? So there's the general question of what's important. There's also the question of in, re, in practice, in reality, am I simply slapping a hechsher on indulging in what I want to indulge in? Or is this really a way to Hashem to really weigh it and to really examine it? And part of part of Tav Vadas also means consulting a Mashpia, a person only a fool thinks that they know everything. They recognize their own limitations. So they, they work through it. They process it. Then there's a totally different thing. The totally different thing is I have an Ashama, I'm a Yid, connected to the Abishter, like Nachshama Raminodav, you jump into the Yamsuf, you you know the the, 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 the good old shluchim of the old days where the Rebbe says go, and then they go, and only later on do they find out where they're living after they already landed. Right? There's no 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 taking anything into consideration. Completely um what appears to be irrational. And so Rashi is addressing the fact that there's these two different things, these two different ways. Now, why is it that one should choose Kedusha? So if you're going with the first approach, Tam Vadas, the reason you choose Kedusha is because, actually, go to the opposite. Why would you choose Klippa? Why should you choose Klippa? Number one, so I'm going to be the Klippa salesman for a minute. Number one, Klippa is easier. So if you're looking for easy, klipa. Wherever there's less kedusha, less of this Hashem, you're gonna have an easier time. Number two, klipa, you're gonna get more. Whatever you want, if you go the klipa route, you're gonna get more. By the way, this is not just like you're gonna get more money. If you learn Torah, so that because you want to feed your ego and everyone to think that you're a very smart person. You'll learn more Torah than if you try and learn Torah because it connects you to Hashem. Okay, it's not just in terms of a virus. When you're choosing Klippa, when you're when you're connecting to the Klippa, it'll be easier and you're going to get more. Okay? What's the downside of Klippa? It's temporary. It's not going to last. Now, there's temporary like five minutes. There's temporary five years. There's temporary five decades. There's temporary five millennia. But temporary is temporary, meaning at the end of the day, whatever you get with klipa goes up in smoke, like we say in Rosh Hashanah Davani. On the other hand, what is the advantage of Kedusha? It's permanent. Whatever a person gets through Kedusha is eternal. It's less. It requires a yigiya, it requires hard work. Hasmada, diligence, bitl, with all of the different complications of what bitl means. But the advantage of living a life of toiv, living a life of, 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 of serving Hashem, is that the chayim, the life that you get, is actually an eternal life. It lasts forever. So that's it. Now, what does that mean? Each person has to translate that into ways that are meaningful and re- meaningful to them. And speak to their life experiences and the choices that they see. And to really isolate where in my life is the choice, not between good and evil, because that's not how we experience it, but between eternal versus convenient. Because that's really the bottom line. Those are the two sides. Eternal and convenient. Now, that's one way of doing it. The other way of doing it is to say, is to, is to not just to say, but to 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 act to believe to 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 and that reveals that there's a there's a part of me that desires kedusha simply because i'm a jew 
It's not that there's two sides to this issue. It's not that this long term it's but no. I as the Rebbe says another mimer on the Siv Malka. I choose the king. Why? Because Nafshi, my soul says such. My soul. That that's my essence. That's my core. That's who I am. That's my identity. The, 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 one of the ways oh, I thought I wanted to turn it off, and I can turn it off. Look at that. <laughs> one of the ways that, that to, to illustrate this is the famous, uh, the famous play, which later became a movie. And I'm not encouraging anyone to see movies. Um, was the fiddler, fiddler on the roof? So the basic story is that the the this Teddy, the milkman, is a regular yid for the shtato, and his daughters are of the modern generation. So the oldest daughter, he wants her to marry the rich butcher. It's a good shidduch, right? He's rich. But she wants to marry the poor tailor because she loves him. So he goes on the one hand and on the other hand and back and forth. In the end, he decides her being happy is more important. So she'll marry the poor tailor. The next daughter says you know, she wants to marry the atheist communist and follow him off to Siberia where he's going into exile. So he's like, on the one end, on the other end, in the end, you know, as long as she's happy. The third daughter wants to marry a local guy. The very famous scene that the Tavi the Milk goes on the one hand, and then he says whatever he says, and on the other hand, and then he has a, a moment where the girl comes out and he goes, there is no other hand! Discussion over! Like, like there's no two sides to the issue. Something breaks. That's the girl. What happened to the understanding, humble, you know, gentle milkman? All of a sudden, that disappeared. And we have a religious fanatic. <laughs> it's the Torah, yeah. and that's a totally different way of serving Hashem, of choosing life. Now, which way does Chassidus say is superior? The chelik, the tam vedas, the integrating into your own life experiences, brayelacha select, or the goyro, the lemayel tam the the, the 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 coming from the etzim of the neshama. Which one does Chassidus in favor of? Everyone's learned that any chassidus knows chassidus is all for etzem, for the man vadas, for the girl, for the religious zealot in each side, of each and every one of us. And the tam vadas always gets a bad rap. That's where the Rebbe is holding, that there's two approaches, but obviously what's the superior approach is the girl. Now we can start to see it. What? So the Rebbe says, Limraisis, despite this, despite the fact that Lamaila Matan Vadas, this 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 zealousness to connect to Hashem that comes from our etzim is so superior. Namar Bapasak, it says in the in the verse, Hachaim Vavam Vamovas Vinasatil Vanacha, life and death I place before you, Ubacharta Vachaim, choose life. Shemadubar Khan, that the Pasik is speaking about here, Alaifin Shabrlacha, in a manner of selecting. Which again we said before, that's the rational, that's the Tambadas, that's using your individual experience. That the Bechira ben Chaim Lamavas, then choosing life between life and death, there should be a selecting. Kamuvan Gam Minadiu Klash and Rashi. And this is understood from the fact that Rashi. He uses a very particular phrasing when he moves to the second thing. He says, Va'al Zenemar, regarding this, it says. Meaning that when Rashi brings up the second idea, this girl, this essence of the Neshama, he doesn't say, he doesn't say Shinemar as it says, which is what he usually does when he brings up Paul. He says, Al Zenemar, regarding this, it says, Sha'inyin Hanachta al Girl Hatayv Laimer Kachlocha. This idea that we should serve Hashem from the, this gairo, this 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 place beyond reason, that is not the meaning of the pasuk when the pasuk says choose life. When the pasuk says choose life, what is the straightforward meaning? What is the tyrant instructing us to do? How should we select kedusha in a way of berlach, in a way of introspection in a way of applying our own life experiences, our own reasoning, to come to appreciate why Kedusha is superior to Klippa. Ella, rather, it happens to be this way of choosing life. Koyal, it includes also this idea something the Torah explains in another place. Meaning, the Rebbe is saying here something very interesting. It's not that there are two ways of choosing. There's one way the Torah wants us to choose, which is not like Tevya. 
not to have like a moment where you flip out. The Torah wants us to select, to put on one side of the scale and on the other side of the scale of and to weigh them through what we learn, through experiences, through bringing, through all of the different manners, journaling if that's your thing, whatever it is, to come to a realization for yourself why Kedusha is superior, why connecting to something eternal is better than connecting to something which is temporary, even if it's easier and even if you get more However, that's the meaning of that puzzle. Rashi says, even though you're doing this type of bechir, which is brerlecha, selecting and rationally thinking through, there contains within this bechir a deeper aspect, a hidden aspect, which is not spoken about in this puzzle, but is spoken about somewhere else until this idea of gairo. Meaning the Rebbe is saying that there's really both kinds of bechir are operating together. And the Rebbe wants to dedicate to this ois to explain how, in fact, it's not two different things, one superior to the other, but really what Chassidus is in favor is of a shilu, of an integration of a rational tamvadas bechira, of choosing based on my own personal experiences, that's really being motivated, really being powered by the etzim, by the essence, by the, this, this, this place in ourselves that doesn't really make sense, this gaira. Now, before we get into the explanation, I want to say something which I think is very important. <laughs> very often in Chassidus, the idea in Chassidus that the Chassidus is actually saying, whether it's a Sikh or Mimer, gets lost because there's so many new ideas along the way. You can have a Mimer where there's, say, 12 chapters of the Mimer, 12 Prakim. And in nine of the prakim, the, the, the Mimer is building this idea, building this idea, building this idea. Only in the last few prakim to say, now that there's this, this idea, we can understand how really the main point is something else entirely. But by that time, you're burnt out. Like Chassidish is currently learning Gili Alukus. And what I keep telling them is, like, as much as the, we think we keep pushing Gili Gili Alukus, the whole point of Samech Vav, which is Mimer we're learning in, is how Gili is not such a good thing. It's like... You also need Gili, but the main point is not Gili. But the problem is, like, right now, you're stuck in that. So sometimes we get so caught up in Bechir and how does it work and the idea of Etzem that what Chassidus, especially the Chassidus Chabad and especially Chassidus of the Rebbe is emphasizing is that it's really not about lauding the Maila of choosing from our Etzem, of this place of girl, this place of, of, of beyond reason, beyond justification. It's really about connecting that place to the rational, mature human being who integrates his life experiences into a cohesive approach to life. It's not about transcending the Tamvadas. It's about bringing something higher into the Tamvadas. And that's what the Rebbe wants to explain here. The Pasuk says, Bechart and choose life. Choose meaning, brother, select, use your seichel, use your experiences, learn, talk, think, blah, blah, blah. And Rashi comes and reveals with his Yenish Torah, including that Balzan Emar, that there's this deeper aspect that should be part of it. Not in place of it, but part of it. So now, what's the explanation? Hasbel Kahu. The explanation is like this. Being in the idea of life and death I've placed before you, Bukhartav Khan should choose life. Shibhir is khalak a chai maide yuhudi. That the choice of life by a Jew, he bakir a khafshis. Is a free choice. Nechlolim shnei dvarim. This includes two things. The idea that we choose life freely includes two things. Now, the Rebbe makes a very big deal about what it means that it's free and doesn't mean free like you don't have to pay for it. It actually, on the contrary, requires a lot of effort. But in what sense is the bechira free? The Rebbe is going to make clear as we as we move through the sikh. Aleph, the first idea. The root of the Jews' choice in godliness stems from the fact that the essence of the Jewish soul is united, so to speak, with the very essence of Hashem. Okay, so why does my neshama choose Hashem? Because it's united with Hashem. There's an obvious problem. If my neshama is united with Hashem, then it seems like there's only one option, which is 
choosing Hashem. So how exactly is that Bechira Chofshis? Where is the freedom here? What is the meaning we say that there's a freedom to the choice on this level? Limrais, despite the fact she built the Afshari, it's impossible that the essence of the soul should choose something other than godliness. So if I can't choose otherwise, how is my choice free? He, the explanation is that a Jew's Choice and his connection to godliness is not coming from a cause or a advantage in this choice. Meaning what? If the reason why I'm choosing Hashem is because I've made a decision to choose Hashem, then what is the actual power <laughs> And energy behind my choice is what makes Hashem, what makes a lukus superior to Klippa. There's a fact. The fact is one thing is better than the other. And that fact is really what's motivating was what is driving my choice. Now, if that's the case, if that would happen, the Rebbe says there's two problems. Sha'az, then Aleph, one. Hiskashus mukbelis lafiyasiba garemasla. The connection you form based on that choice is limited to its cost. So first thing is, if I'm choosing something because it's better, I'm only committed to the degree that it's better or the degree to which I appreciate that it's better. So my connection is limited. Bayes. This can't be considered true free will. Because this cause, a person is, so to speak, compelled to choose it. A person can't, a very simple thing. Can a person choose to take $10 instead of $100? All things being equal, right? No, there's no trick. You give a person, you can have $10 or $100. No trick. A person, now if a person chooses the $10, that says to us, when either they're trying to be funny, right? They don't really care about the money. They don't know how to do math, right? But if they're sincere, they value money and they understand that 100 is 10 times 10. At that point, it becomes psychologically impossible for them to pick the 10. In other words, the way human mind works is that once we've clarified this thing is superior, I can't help but select it. I can't help but connect to it. Which means I'm reacting. And this is the essence. The Rebbe understands freedom and Bechira is primarily an absence of reaction. If I'm reacting to something outside myself, that's not freedom. Which means having a compelling reason, hear the words, having a compelling reason is the opposite of freedom. Because what is the reason? It's compelling me. In addition, there's the first point. I'm only committed, I'm only devoted to the degree the reason compels me, no more. My preference for $100 over $10 is 10 times, no more. On Purim, we're supposed to get drunk. So you don't know the difference between Ara Haman and Baruch Mordechai. And there's many different explanations as to what that means. And I guess it goes without saying, but I'll say it anyway. Anyone who drinking is... A danger to them or others, begashmi, so beruchnis, obviously you shouldn't be drinking. But one of the explanations of Chassidus is that if you know the difference between Haman and Mordechai, then your commitment to the path of Mordechai is to the degree to which you recognize how much superior Mordechai is over Haman. And the idea of Purim is this very idea. So the Gairil, the I'm not picking the path of Mordechai because I appreciate that it's five times better, ten times better. It's good for this reason or that reason. But because I'm a Jew, I'm also a Yehudi. So freedom doesn't mean I have options. Options is, creates, is the illusion of freedom. The freedom comes from the fact that I'm operating from a place where I am proactive. Not that I'm reacting. This is what the Rebbe says. 
And the Rebbe emphasizes those words. Meaning that the choice is based, that this is the will of the essence of the soul of its own accord. It's not coming from anything outside itself. And because it doesn't have any external cause, this choice in a manner that it completely negates anything other than godliness. If my choice of the $100 is based on the fact that $100 is 10 times better than $10, then if you tell me that this $100 bill has a virus on it, and this $10 bill doesn't have a virus on it, I don't know if it's hygienic, but it, it doesn't have a virus on it, it's going to kill me, give me quarantine for 14 days or whatever, then all of a sudden now what happens? Now I'll take the $10, thank you very much. Yeah. The extra $90 is not worth the, the, the dangers of having a virus. Meaning that no matter how, how sincere you are in your choice, if your choice is being compelled by reason, the choice still leaves the possibility for to revisit it and select the other thing. Whereas if it's because I, of my own accord, attach myself to something, then, there, then I'm entirely committed. There was once a person who put it this way. If, when he's asked if he could have chosen differently, he says, I could have chosen differently, but if I had chosen differently, it wouldn't have been my choice. What does that mean? If it's my choice, that's to come from me. If it's from me, then this, that was me. The fact that theoretically we could think of other options, but that's negating the fact that deep down I have a core, there's who I am. Now, one of the things that sometimes bothers people about this idea, and the Rebbe addresses it in the footnotes and later on in the Sicha and in a Maimer, is that seemingly this idea that the Neshama chooses Hashem because it comes from its essence and that choice is so absolute and negates any other possibilities, seemingly is because Hashem to use the words I've heard before from other people, programmed the neshama that way. She made the neshama that way. So it's not really free. So the answer to that is to ask the question, are there things Hashem is incapable of doing? And here we differentiate between the philosopher and the Jew. The philosopher says, well, maybe, you know, there's paradoxes and, you know, I don't know, but like, you know, like anything that theoretically could be done, he can do. Like if he can't do it, it's because I don't know. Can he make a can he make a number which is both odd and even? I don't know. The philosophers get nervous about those kinds of things. But Pashtas, you know, he can do anything. You know, any normal thing he could do. You know, give wealth to this nation, wipe out that nation, make a flood. He can do. You know, he can do anything. What does it say in, in the Medrash? It says Shem says about the Jewish people, Lachlifam Buma Cheres to exchange the Jewish people with another nation. I am unable to do so. That's what Hashem says. So if you're a believer and you're a Yid and Hashem says he can't do it, that means he can't do it. Now you have to ask the question. He, what, he lacks the power? So this is the question. Is ability merely mean that you have the power to do so? Yeah. I have the power to do a lot of things that I'm incapable of doing because they're a violation of who I am. And if it's and the Rebbe points out, if Hashem can have that kind of a of, of a of a of a of an identification of who he is, and no one created Hashem Kas Vashalom, then that means that the same thing is true of the Neshama. It's not that Hashem created the Neshama with this nature. And that the Alter Rebbe even said the Rebbe even says that what it says in Tanya, the Neshama has a nature, that nature is due to the Bechira. In other words, and this is this is something that makes people nervous. The same way no one made Hashem that way. But he chooses the Jewish people and that choice makes it impossible for him to reject the Jewish people. Even though he has the power, but he doesn't have the ability to go a violation of who he is. That is the exact same thing that's happening in the Neshama. The Neshama is mirroring what's happening in Hashem. It's not a creation, a creature designed by Hashem. And so we say in Chassidus on the place the Neshama is a particular nature, that's as a result of the Bechira. Because I'm because my Neshama chose Hashem, now my Neshama is his nature to be drawn to Hashem. So the freedom here is, is, is a true freedom because there's nothing external compelling it. And the model for that is just like there's nothing compelling Hashem. And that's the counterintuitive point. If there's nothing compelling me, then I have no options. 
Options means on some level I'm tariff to the issue and external things are compelling me one way or the other. So that means I could go either way. The inability to go either way doesn't come from a lack of power. It comes because of an internal sense, a self-definition. This is who I am. That's Hashem says, who am I? Right. Those to identify themselves at their core. Now, that's the root of the Bechira, which means when a Jew is using his Bechira, really what he's doing, he's tapping into the idea, no one can tell me what to do. And the level of no one can tell me what to do is a level which, where, where, where I'm free of outside influence, and so my neshama has determined for itself, well, what is my identity? That's the, that's the place that we're drawing. But then the Rebbe goes and says, there's another aspect. Beis, revealing the choice in godliness. This happens in the mind, in the intellect, in the rationality of the person. Why? Sorry, the, the, the fact that the will of a Jew for Elokus is his own free will is evident only when he actually has in reality two paths, a chaivamavas, life and death, and chooses life. In other words, it's true that the freedom comes from the etzim of the neshama. But just because that because that's free doesn't mean it's evident that it's free. So put it this way. At what point does the neshama actually discover that it's free? So I'll give you a very simple example. At what point do you discover what your values are? So you grow up in a home, in a community that has certain values. How do you know if those are your values? When you encounter other values. When you encounter other values. Then you discover, oh, no, no, it's not just those were the values I was surrounded with. Those are my values. Because I choose these values even when other values present themselves as a viable option. How does a Jew discover that his connection to Hashem is not because he's programmed that way? When he's in a place, when he's in a reality, which is the reality we live in, where klipa is a viable option, where he can hear the, the, the sales pitch of the klipa. It's free, it's easy, it's convenient, you'll get a lot, and it speaks to him. And Becholzeis, and despite that, he doesn't choose the klipa. He actually comes to realize what makes the klipa the wrong choice. He doesn't just reject the klipa in Maisa Bapal. It's very interesting. The Rebbe doesn't say it's simply Maisa Bapal not doing the thing, but it's using his seichel to appreciate why it's wrong. So, and that use of his seichel has to be proactive. A Jew comes and says, I have life, I have death, I have kedusha, I have klipa, and I'm going to actually make an effort to justify to myself why the Kedusha is the right choice. So the root of that is his predisposition towards Kedusha that comes from his true freedom, his true autonomy. But how does he see that it's really his? Because he is the one trying to find a, an explanation, a justification why Kedusha is right when Klipa is so appealing. So when he has the other option and he rejects it, that reveals that it's actually coming from him. So the Yisoy, the foundation, the basis is not what makes Kedusha superior. But the fact that it's really, it's, it's, it's free is only evident when he actually has to contend with something else. So the, again, there's the root of it and there's how it's revealed, how it's made evident, how, how a Jew discovers in his own experiences. Which is why, when do you discover that you really have free will? When you're conflicted. When you're operating on the level of your etzim and when it's revealed, when you're aroused to tshuva, when you're when you when you when you're, when you're inspired, you don't actually experience your free will. Not that it's not there, but you don't experience that it's free. It's there, it's active, but it's behelim. It's operating subliminally, subconsciously. So it's such that it even says in my mom, that can't really be called free will because you don't experience the freedom. But when you feel conflicted between the two drachim. And you don't just simply say, oh, I'll do the right thing. You build an approach to life that works for you, that allows you to reject the death 
in that you actually experience firsthand how you're proactive, how you're the one driving the narrative. That's the gil, it's the revelation of the free will. And that means when you're doing it that way, you're drawing the lamayl matavadas into the tamvadas, the above reason into your actual rational, pragmatic way of dealing with issues in life. V'zeh, turn the page, and the Rebbe says, V'zeh yitachin, this is only feasible, rak v'seich lo'adam, only when the person is operating rationally. Only then, ha'yocha limtza yisoyinis v'shnei adrochim, he can see what's compelling about both approaches. U'becholza, he said, nonetheless, u'becharta v'chaim, he chooses life. L'fichach, therefore, nemar b'pasuk, it says in the verse, ha'chai v'mavos asatil v'necha, life and death I place before you, meaning, Operate on a level of seichel. Operate on a level where you actually feel the conflict. Acknowledge klipa has its selling points. You can't deny that. And nonetheless, choose life. Because in real life, the avayda has to be a matter of selecting. Which means like this. Next time the mishpia slams his fist on the table to febrengen, or whatever is the corollary to that, wherever you're holding in life, and says, you have an neshama, and you just have to reveal your neshama, you can internally say, that's a bunch of baloney. <laughs> because the mind of the sicha says, the pasuk says, I have to appreciate both sides of the issue. And then I have to work to come to appreciate on my own why a life of Torah and mitzvahs of Vaitis Hashem and filling the Kavana Yaina, the Shlichas that were on earth, why that's the better choice for me? Not simply to just flip a switch. However, Achrashi Megala, Rashi reveals the Yaina Shal Torah with the wine of the Torah, the secrets of the Torah, as a Mashmoy Sapinimis Shal Bachat the inner meaning, the inner content of what's happening when you choose life. That you placed my hand on this good lot and said, This take for yourself. The inner dimension, the real behind the scenes of what's going on when we make a so called rational choice and choosing a lakus, it's really the girl that irrational place in the etzman shama. Which really negates an entirety. Moves death, vera, kach, such a yesh, tzorch, rak, the kach, all you need to do is take it. Kfishal is about to explain earlier. Now, this is not automatic. You can learn this very soon. It's automatic. Anytime you choose, it's not automatic. What the Rebbe is saying here is if, if you're making this choice in a way that's really motivated deep down by the Bechir of the Etzem, then once you come to the decision, that Kedusha, Chayim, Toiv, life is right, there, you, you, you have the same absolutism, the same um, unlimited connection that you do from that to Meneshama. And this is one of the things that we find that even though when we learn and we discuss and we think and, and we do things, one of the things that a person discovers if they do that stuff with a sincerity is that the level of commitment that they come to afterwards is not proportional to the process. That at the end of the day, all of the explanations, as much as it's convincing, somehow there's more of a commitment, more depth, more sincerity than can be really explained based on what I rationalized. Why? Because what the Chassidus does is Chassidus gives a Jew the power that his is choosing life in a way of using his tampadas is actually empowered by the neshama. It's not an automatic thing. But we see in actuality that many times a person chooses the right thing and then they get more information and they reverse their choice. And the power to make a choice in a using your tampadas but that has the, the unlimited and absolutism of, of higher than tampadas is to approach your seichel through the teachings of chassidus. And, and first and foremost, that means on a very practical level, learning inside the text and actually working hard to understand what it's saying and equally what it's not saying. And when a person puts that effort in and then secondary, not, and then second to that, not secondarily, but second to that, then putting the effort of saying, what does that mean for me? 
through their own personal bonus contemplation and praying with friends and consulting with a mashpia, that yigiyah, that effort, turned choice of brerlacha, of simply selecting with your seichel, into what Rashi says, that it's a goyro, it's the etzim and neshama, and we see in practice how the person is actually able to tap into the neshama without having a, a nervous breakdown and having a moment and having a who knows what, but to live daily, daily, at every moment with their etzim and neshama. That's the, the main point that everything goes on to connect it to Rosh Hashanah, um, which is very nice, but you know we're going to hold it here. Um, as a nice compliment to the Sikh, in addition to the fact that there's wonderful footnotes, which we didn't get to, but I, I think everybody should learn. Um, I recommend the Maimer um, Al Kenkara, which I mentioned, where the Rebbe elaborates on these ideas um, more at length. And of course, the Maimer is an edited Maimer, it's a Muga Maimer, so there's plenty of footnotes for someone who wants to expand from there and see the, the full breadth of the issue. Um, uh, <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah